Hello, I'm Sandy Johnson, President Emeritus of the National Press Foundation. We know reporters are focused on the candidates running for office on November 3rd, but journalists also have an obligation to help voters understand changes to voting laws and rules in their states. These voting, voting barriers include voter ID laws, purges of voter registration rolls, polling place closures or consolidations, intimidation at the polls, and confusion about mail-in ballots. To help you, we have with us today three expert speakers. Wendy Weiser, Vice President for the Democracy Program at the Brennan Center for Justice, Scott Bland, Editor of Politico Campaign Pro, and joining us later, Dale Ho, Director of the Voting Rights Project at ACLU. So welcome. Wendy, let's start with you. Why is the media important to voter education about barriers to voting? Well, thank you for having me and thank you all for joining us. Um, I think this is uh, an election um, unlike any other and an election where the role of the media is um, so, so much more critical to the integrity of our voting process than any that I've certainly witnessed. Um, we are experiencing not only unprecedented challenges to the election, but an unprecedented amount of change in the voting process, unprecedented confusion about the rules of voting. And that is both in part because of all the changes that people are seeing, but also because we have an unprecedented degree of disinformation about the voting process coming um, not only from our foreign adversaries, and that's been stepped up a lot, and we are not hearing as much about that, but it has actually stepped up a lot this year, and even from the President of the United States. There are lots of ways with all these changes to the voting process, and especially with the expansion of vote by mail, which many Americans are not familiar with, um, that for voters to get tripped up. So it is very, very important for there to be as much voter education as possible for people to understand the correct information about how to vote and to understand how not to get tripped up so that their ballots will count. And I think that um, there's also an unprecedented degree of um, conflict and, and over the rules of the voting process. And this is something that we, I work in day in, day out at the Brennan Center, but the number of lawsuits and challenges and state laws um, in dispute this year far exceeds any other year that I have seen. There are more than 200 lawsuits pending in courts across the country right now still. Voting process. And so it's important and, and difficult to challenge for journalists to both talk about the um, challenges to our election process at the same time as not confusing voters and adding to the um, misinformation or confusion about how to vote. The kind of two other challenges I just want to throw out there, um, one, the elephant in the room, the, the other thing that is really unusual about this election is it's the first time in U.S. history that a sitting U.S. president is actually making um, an attack on the integrity of our election system an attack on the voter, on our voting process, a central um, campaign strategy, a central talking point, and even a central governing um, approach. And that is adding to the challenges, especially for journalists. And some of these attacks involve efforts to confuse or intimidate voters or threats of disrupting the election process that are very alarming, most of which are overblown, and that cause damage by causing people to believe them. <laughs> so it does create a lot of challenges for journalists, and I think actually providing accurate information, not inflaming fears, um, but you know, reporting uh, accurately on the, these conflicts is, is a real, um, important service and um, we're happy to help you with that. Scott, do you want to add to the uh, your thoughts on the media's role? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think just to go along with that, I think in, in past elections it was very easy for journalists and journalism to uh, kind of fall into, into this trap of just thinking about the process of voting as something that just happens uh, without, you know, without a second thought and, and the, the pandemic and the, 
um, all, all these changes, uh, some of which what Wendy just picked through, uh, especially about voting by mail, have uh, certainly opened my eyes and, and, and a lot of people's eyes to how many tripwires there are built into this process, uh, whether it's uh, just because it's completely different in all 50 states or uh, for a variety of other reasons. And so I think, you know, I, I think this is really just um, at home, you know, what an important role uh, journalists can can play in, uh, in in educating people about this and explaining what's really going on, how the election really works, and uh, helping people figure out how to navigate it and also not be surprised at any point in the process, especially, you know, election night and what comes after. Wendy, could you set the table for us a bit by um, giving us a, a snapshot history of um, uh, voting suppression and bar barriers to voting in this country? So, well, wow, that's a, a big question. Um, and uh, I'll say that, you know, we are seeing um, a real uptick this year in, in attempts at vote suppression. Um, this is not anything new. The history of our country has been filled with um, backlash against voters and attempt to suppress votes and especially based on race and especially um, since um, the, um, since reconstruction. Um, but by and large, um, most of the history, the major thrust has been towards expanding um, who, who is eligible to vote um, and um, making the voting process more convenient and removing barriers. Starting about um, it, well, really uh, probably 2000, um, but really um, ticking up um, substantially after the 2010 election, there was a new modern strategy to try to um, manipulate the rules of the election process. So it wasn't um, the old Jim Crow tactics, it was new tactics to put in place barriers to voting um, through, typically through legislation, but not only through legislation. So whether it be strict voter ID laws or rolling back on voter registration opportunities or early voting days or making it impossible for people to get their voting rights restored. We saw a surge starting in 2010 and then upticking even more after the Supreme Court gutted the core of the Voting Rights Act in um, 2013 um, across the country so that even before the pandemic hit, here um, in 2020, um, voters in half the states of the country are facing more restrictive voting rules it is where it's harder to vote in their state than it was back in 2010. And so there's been this real backwards push. And this push has been driven by a narrative um, and justified by the need to protect against voter fraud. And, and I'm saying this because we all know that, and, and even um, while he was running in 2016, that Donald Trump has been the principal um, purveyor of the, the falsehood that our elections are uh, marred by widespread voting fraud. But he did not invent this tactic. This has been the, this has been the justification that has been used um, not just for, the, for more than a decade now, um, just less brazenly to justify vote suppression measures um, across the country. And even if you look back in the history books about what it looked like in Reconstruction and what the arguments were for um, vote suppression then, um, there, it, it is always couched in the language of voter fraud. And so uh, I'll flag that. Um, I, I wanna just sort of say that this is part of a broader set of um, issues where uh, of trying to reduce the political power, especially um, of black and brown communities. Um, so the, this vote suppression that we're seeing is part of, um, th there have been real um, rollbacks um, in terms of like extreme partisan and racial gerrymandering across the country efforts to, um, and efforts that we're litigating in all of these areas um, and working on policy-wise to undermine the census <laughs> um, and to um, ensure that, uh, and to prevent every, um, Ameri every uh, person in the United States from being counted as required by the Constitution. Um, and, um, and then also just efforts to make the voting process harder. 
And so it, it's just important to also see this in a broader context of um, there, there's a, a power struggle going on and um, the, it is not just partisan. There is also a, a strong um, race discrimination element to it. And we hear it in the echoes of the language that the president was using, but we also see it in the impact of all of these policies that are either being put in place or that are being attempted. And I'm happy to talk a little more about what those impacts are later. <laughs> Uh, Scott, how does this year's political atmosphere exacerbate coverage of vote barriers? Uh, there's, there's a few different ways. I think the, the two main ones that, that come to mind that we've been grappling with are, first of all, uh, voting by mail uh, is this growing uh, piece of elections that uh, until now has been uh, fairly nonpartisan, and and that's no longer the case. It's become a partisan punching bag uh, this year because uh, the president decided, uh, despite using it, that he doesn't like it, um, and so that's had a few that's had a, a a few different effects, right? We've seen in in polling data and ballot request data that uh, suddenly uh, registered Democrats. Are, are significantly more likely to, uh, to, to vote by mail, to want to vote by mail than, uh, than Republicans. And, and I think just the, the rhetoric around all that has, um, has been a challenge uh, at times because um, when, you know, when the president says something, it's, uh, it's always been, and, and, important thing to, to cover, but the, some of the stuff he says about, about voting by mail really just doesn't make any sense, and um, it sows confusion, and um, dealing with that has been, has been a process. Um, the second thing I would say is uh, about how yeah, issues of this year have, have kind of exacerbated problems with voting barriers and how we cover them. It is related to that. It's that I, I think there's journalists have a responsibility to cover barriers uh, and, and issues with the voting process in a way that doesn't convince people that their vote doesn't matter and, or, or that it would be easier not to bother. Um, we were just thinking about this this yesterday, actually, where the, with the president standing up at the, the first debate and uh, calling for his supporters to flock to, to polling places on, on election day. Um, obviously, this is important news. This is the thing that's happening. Um, but uh, I, I think it's important to cover that in a way that doesn't make people think, it's, you know, maybe I shouldn't be going to, to vote on election day because it sounds like uh, this, this thing is happening. Um, so there's a bunch of issues you, like that that we're, we're wrestling with. Yeah, actually, could I ask you about about the internal wrestling when a politician says, um, you know, cries uh, vote fraud. How do you counter that in the copy and in your headlines? Well, you know, I, I think you just need to, to make sure to, um, to write the background of, of what's been going on into the story. Um, the, uh, and, and, you know, my, my, Colleague Zach Montalario who covers a lot of these uh, issues for us. I think talk, talks to you a fair bit, Wendy, and uh, he, he, he's talking to other folks. He, he's he's been able to get grounded in in the history of this, in the uh, the data of this, and just present the picture of what's going on uh, in in real life when when this comes up. And and I, th I think that's just the more, most important thing. It uh, it takes a little more time than just writing down the quote. Um, but it's also, it's not, it's not difficult. It's not, um, it's not overly time consuming uh, either. It's just, it kind of takes a little bit of just an extra step and thought process to, to think through uh, the, the, the steps of how to go about this when, when it happens. Yeah, Wendy, this is a, a common dilemma for newsrooms, you know, how to, if a politician, president or some, or some other candidate cries voter fraud, um, you know, what, what is your suggestion for, you know, fl rather than simply saying comma, which is not true or which is not accurate, how can they in a compelling way, um, you know, counteract um, 
politicians' uh, comments like that? So I, I think that that's a really important question. It's probably a central dilemma of covering this president writ large. Um, and it's the problem of telling people not to think of an elephant, then they're going to think of an elephant. And I think that that, that is part of the dilemma here is that the um, goal um, uh, is really just to get people to think voter fraud, voter fraud, voter fraud. And if they just hear it, even if they hear that it's false, they are, you know, that's what they're going to be left with. Um, and, and there's a lot of great resources right now and an increasing number of resources that I've seen for journalists like at the Neiman Lab and a bunch of other journalism organizations that deal with how to cover disinformation, especially when disinformation is being a tactic. My own view is, you know, it's do it in the affirmative, you know, our, uh, our elections, you know, mail voting is secure, despite what the president says. And then, you know, or, or there are a lot of protections in place for, you know, like, like as opposed to repeating the uh, the lie when when we know something is and it's been repeated and it's been repeatedly debunked um that that's important i think that there is um i i encourage folks to look at the um the resources um that that have been put out there about you know it's important for people to understand the context of the um you know why this is happening and, and why and why there might be um, misinformation that's being put out there. Um, I, I think that that helps contextualize it. Um, and, um, and I think um, it very, very important to make sure that um, in the end, it's very clear that this is not true, that it is, that it's not on both sides. <laughs> that, you know, when something is clearly a, a, a lie or a, a falsehood, that it be articulated as such, Otherwise, I think it's harder and harder to um, dislodge it. Um, okay, next what I'd like to do is talk about some specific barriers to voting and how reporters can get information about it to their readers. Uh, the first one is um, voter registration and changes to the rolls um, as we approach the election. Uh, Wendy, do you want to start with that one? Absolutely. We are rapidly um, approaching voter registration deadlines in, in many states. And I think that it, it is this year in particular, it is especially important for people to be reminded both of their voter registration deadlines and of how they can register to vote because most of the avenues by which people ordinarily register to vote have not been available this year. And we have documented, um, as have others, and we put out um, research showing a dramatic drop in voter registration rates across the country because our their motor vehicle offices to get their driver's licenses renewed they are not going to their naturalization ceremonies or to their county fairs where um, civic groups might be um, engaging in voter registration drives um, and so there there is a little bit more work um, placed on the individual voter to affirmatively get in front of voter registration rather than having voter registration put in front of them. Um, in, in even in jurisdictions, and we've seen some tremendous advance across the country over the last couple of years towards um, implementing automatic voter registration where voters who um, uh, consent will be automatically signed up when they um, interact with other government agencies, but that depends on them interacting with other government agencies, which hasn't been happening a lot during the pandemic. So, you know, so this is a serious deficit right now, and I think that there is a lot of voter education information needed to say, hey, you know, in, in most states, or at least 39 states and DC people, and actually there's more that actually added online options. There's a couple of five or six more that have added online options for this year alone. People can register to vote online, and um, there are some people, some of the online systems require you to have a DMV ID, in which case you have to use a different method of registering, but you can all find a way to do it remotely if you want to. Um, but that's uh, making those options known to people and contacting state and local election officials to, um, to show what the availability is, I think is it, this is the right moment to do it. This is when people are most focused on the election and most getting engaged and can most easily be tripped up. And every election, and this election might be a little different because there are new challenges, but for at least the last um, number of elections, typically the the number one or at least number two reason that eligible voters get disenfranchised is that there's a problem with their registration or they weren't signed up. And so that, that is 
always our, our number one barrier. And, and by problem with the registration, I don't mean uh, that they were ineligible. <laughs> it was it was purged or there was some glitch that meant their registration didn't go through. Um, and so that, that this is a, a, a very important public service. Um, can you quantify the drop in voter registration? I can, and I think it's a, we uh, all, um, the, it varies state by state, and some it, it dropped by as much as 70%, um, and some, there actually, there were a few, uh, I think we, we looked at 21 states, um, and uh, I think the average was roughly um, 38 to 40%, the drop in voter registration. There were four states where there actually wasn't a drop, where there was a slight uptick, but almost all of the others saw significant drops. Um, this is a study by my colleague, Peter um, Miller, um, and so I'll, I'll refer you to the actual study on this. Um, there was some earlier research done um, by 538, um, again, that was earlier, and maybe in the summer, um, that documented some drops in um, registration at that time, but this is this study that we did is um, looking at it as of uh, maybe two weeks ago. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll include a link to the Peter Miller um, research in the story that I write. Um, Scott, how, what coverage have you guys been doing on voter registration, um, drives, and also purges to voting rolls? Yeah, actually, I have a, I have a question for, for Wendy really quick before we when, when you say drops in the rate, this is compared to the rate of adding new voters in, in like past presidential elections as opposed yes. to the, the yes. total number, right? Yes, that um, is. We, we're, we're looking at um, what, what you would comp, what you would ordinarily expect registration to be right now, I and mean, this is the period when it spikes. And, and frankly, in every election, you see a spike starting in August and really upticking in September and October until the voter registration deadline. It goes in a real steep curve. Um, presidentials, it is the biggest. Like that's when most voters get added to the rolls, typically in our system. So. Sandy, I think to, just to answer your question, we've been approaching it uh, in terms of, first of all, kind of trying to start from scratch a little bit and and just, you know, if it, in terms of just explaining how the system works at the various processes, you know, there's, there's these various uh, uh, signposts on, on the road toward, toward voting. You have to register, then you have to uh, figure out how you're going to do it, whether it's getting a ballot in the mail and or, or what have you. And so uh, we've, the way we've gone at it is to, to uh, kind of cover some ways that it's changing uh, in different places, whether in response to coronavirus or, or legislation for other reasons, uh, but then also uh, trying to provide resources that, uh, you know, kind of walk through state by state the various, um, uh, the various rules and regulations that, that are in place for all different parts of the voting process. And voter registration is where that starts uh, in every place. This year, for the first time, I actually checked my voter registration a month or so ago. I'm not sure why, I guess because of the headlines. But um, I mean, how real is that threat that, that, um, that your name has mysteriously dropped from the voter rolls? Um, you know, I, I know there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, but Wendy, have you guys been able to, you know, in, in any you know, systemic way, understand um, how that happens or uh, how many people get dropped? So we've been documenting and we've been studying voter purges of the voter rolls for, um, you know, quite some time. We've run studies after the last two federal elections and found that between um, 2014 and 2016 and 2016, 2018, both we had 16 million and then 17, 17 million and 16 million voters um, removed from the voter rolls during those periods respectively, that, that's a lot of people whose names are removed. Now, some of them are being removed, you know, appropriately. <laughs> there has been, uh, you know, people move, people die. I mean, that this, our, our voter rolls do have to be kept out, up to date. But, you know, one of the things that we've documented and found this consistently is that there are also significant racial disparities in um, how um, purges happen. And we found um, actually that the jurisdictions that used to be covered by the Voting Rights Act, because they had a history of discrimination um, in the voting system, were, had much higher purge rates than the jurisdictions that were not. And so, which suggests that there was, and what we also, I guess the other thing we found is that those jurisdictions had a real spike in their purge rates 
after the Supreme Court gutted the Core of the Voting Rights Act, which suggested that the um, that section of the Voting Rights Act was actually um, restraining aggressive voter purges that you know was um, impacting black and brown voters, and so that's a, a concern. We, we also saw you know that there's been a, an uptick in purges based on um, an individual not voting because the Supreme Court um, a couple of years ago upheld a, a process coming out of Ohio where um, if, if people could be um, flagged for potential remover from the voter rolls merely because they didn't vote in one election and then failed to respond to a, a notice that came from the state and people don't always look at their mail and the postcards that might come and so I think that they, at this point, and I think uh, the most important thing that people can do is what you did is registration. Just make sure that, um, you know, that there haven't been any mistakes, that there haven't been any changes and make any corrections now. There's, there's still time to do that everywhere in the country and you can inoculate yourself against those problems. And, you know, many jurisdictions you can correct in a growing number of jurisdictions, you can correct it at the polls on election day as more and more states are adopting same day registration, but that's still less than half the country. And, you know, really what we need to do is adopt automatic and same day registration nationwide. So this, this suddenly becomes a non-issue. <laughs> But I want to make sure I got that number right. You said that between 2014 and 2018, 17 million. So 2014, and so like there was a two year period before 2016, the two year period before 2018, it was 17 million and 16 million respectively. So it's, it's a lot of. That's people. a substantial so number. Some states that, you know, like Georgia, we've been studying, like Georgia has very high purge rates and, you know, is purging 10, 11% of their voters during those windows. Um, there are, so there are particular states that are, you know, have particularly high purge rates. There's also been, you know, a fair number of purge scandals, like even here in Brooklyn, where I am, <laughs> the last election, there was a, a, a scandal where, you know, several hundred thousand people were mistakenly removed from the voter rolls. So, you know, th this could happen by um, you know, malicious design, or it could happen by accident. Uh, I think that, you know, what we need to have are safeguards in the system so that it doesn't disenfranchise people. But in the meantime, if you're somewhere where you don't have those safeguards in the system, uh, this is a time where you can avert that problem. <laughs> Scott, did you want to add anything about voter purges? Oh, I, just in terms of covering it, you know, I think, uh, you know, obviously, like jumping into uh, the numbers and what's happening, um, way, you know, talking to advocacy groups and things like that is a, is a great way to jump into it. But also, there's so much litigation around this uh, everywhere, and and that um, it's it's more or less always happening uh, in in one state or another. But uh, you know, when you mentioned the uh, Ohio case, Georgia has seen um, a lot of uh, conflict about this, and um, it's. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a really important avenue of coverage. Mm -hmm. um, while we're on this topic, maybe this would be the moment to talk about um, polling place con closings and consolidations. Um, what's new on that front, Wendy? So, you know, we all saw there were dramatic polling place consolidations during the primaries and closings, and this was especially concentrated in urban population centers, and the result were extremely unconscionably long lines in you know, places like, you know, we all watched Milwaukee was the first one, Atlanta, Philadelphia, and, and, and that were disproportionately impacting black and brown voters. This um, was an early response to the pandemic. It, it, we actually did a study looking at the Milwaukee lines and found that it actually led to, this was a, a colleague named Kevin Morris, who is the researcher on that, but look, found that it not only, it reduced um, turnout in Wisconsin's April primary by 8.3% and for African-American voters by 10.2%. So it, it, it had a you know, significant impact on, on people's participation just from the polling place consolidations alone. So that's sort of the bad news. And, and part of that is because there, there was, we weren't prepared for the pandemic. A lot of poll workers called in sick. Um, there was a dramatic
shortage of poll workers. And there were a lot of places that used to be used as polling places that were no longer available or suitable for being polling places, whether they be schools or nursing homes or <laughs> other buildings that, or, or places that didn't, um, actually this is, in the early parts of the primaries, we didn't even know that um, social distancing and masks would be a way of creating um, you know, safer um, indoor environments. Um, so that, that's sort of the bad news. Um, the, and a lot of the conditions that led to that are still present. There's still a poll worker shortage, though that's been mitigated a lot. Um, there's still a challenge. Uh, uh, there, there's been a lot of, um, I guess, improvement, and I wanted to just flag that. There's been a push nationwide to try to restore all the polling places that are typically open during an election. And part of that is the recognition, which people didn't necessarily all realize during the election, that just because we're seeing a surge in absentee ballots, that doesn't mean we're still not going to see a surge of voters on election day. Part of that is there is a dramatic um, surge in interest in participating in this election, and we're seeing historically high um, engagement and um, turnout um, after you know a couple of years, um, or especially the, the historic low point um, back in 2014, where it was the lowest turnout in um, 72 years, we've really swung the pendulum. Part of it is now we've learned um, a lot more about the pandemic and that there are in fact safe ways to uh, hold in-person voting. And there have been a lot of public health guidelines. We put some out with um, public health organizations. The CDC have put some out and there are some basic principles for how to do this. And um, a part of it is election officials have learned from the primaries. And so one of the you know, silver linings of otherwise disastrous <laughs> early starts to the primaries is there was a dry run for the general election and we learned some of the things that could go wrong and we now have been able to fix and adjust. And so what we saw, if we take Wisconsin again in Milwaukee, they went from over 180 polling places to five um, in their April primary. They, um, by, uh, by August, when they had a state primary, they were back up to 168, I believe it was. So they had restored most of the polling places. They, they learned from that. And we're seeing, we've also seen this dramatic infusion of um, assistance from um, the private sector, the not-for-profit, including the donation of spaces to serve as polling places, um, most um, vividly by sports teams <laughs> across the country. But I think that the, there's been a, a lot of coming together and a dramatic mobilization effort um, by groups like Power to the Polls and others to try to um, replenish the poll worker ranks um, by people who, for whom it's healthy to serve as poll workers, and also a recognition that you actually need to have a lot more poll workers than you ordinarily expect because there will be last minute changes. There will be, you, you need to have an overage over what you, your ordinary staffing needs are. So again, there was a lot of learning. And so I expect not to see as many polling place consolidations and closures. I think we're gonna be much more close to where we were in 2016. That said, there are still efforts to stop that. There is even litigation that the Trump campaign and the RNC have to try to prevent the expansion of polling places in certain jurisdictions. So I don't mean to suggest there are no problems, but we're, it's not nearly um, the problems that we saw in the primaries. And I think Americans can feel safe to vote in polling places. That The other thing I would add is that we've also seen an expansion of early voting um, and most Americans uh, they already had an opportunity to vote early in person, and that has increased during the pandemic. And that's a great way to flatten the curve as well. I'm at polling places, and so um, I think that's something worth, um, you know, as part of the voter education campaign, but also um, noting that as a, a, a positive change, and that one is one I expect will stick past this election. Scott, how can journalists write about these issues? Well, it, it's it's been interesting. I think, and, and you know, I think traditionally we think of uh, stories about the campaign being being politics stories, but in in this way, uh, a big part of the twenty twenty election has become a, a government story. It's a and the local government story um, in a lot of places about the the different changes states are making. In some states, uh, you know, county clerks are or or the equivalent uh, official is. Are, are delegated an enormous amount of power to kind of make their own uh, decisions about how to um, 
how to deal with, with stuff like this. And so, you know, in, in some ways it's very similar. You, you have uh, groups, tr uh, groups trying to mobilize uh, large numbers of people to, to do things, but instead of in the campaign, it's trying to mobilize voters, you're trying to mobilize poll workers, trying to uh, figure out places to, to put these people on and have this done. And, um, and so, you know, honestly, I think it's, it's, you can look at things a little bit through the same lens, but you just need to shift the focus a little bit from kind of the, the politics onto um, the, the, the government part of it and also the groups working hand in hand uh, with the government to try and make spaces available or recruit volunteers or things like that. What's new with uh, voter ID laws this year? Wendy? So, uh, um, you know, one thing that we've seen, and, and there's, um, and I'll get the jurisdictions, is there, there have been some successful lawsuits this year challenging the use, uh, the, um, there were only a few, this is a minority of jurisdictions, but that require voter IDs with absentee ballots or with absentee ballot requests. Um, as you might imagine, this is a, a heavy burden for people who need absent, absentee ballots because they are ill or risk contracting the coronavirus to actually require them to go out somewhere to get a different document in order to vote that absentee ballot. And courts have been responsive to, and this has been especially true for um, Native American voters. And so we've seen um, some, like several successful lawsuits that are removing um, the um, ID requirements in states that actually had those requirements for absentee ballots. Um, on, you know, more broad voter ID requirements, um, there, there hasn't been um, much change this year otherwise. Um, we, we did see a real uptick um, around the country in putting in place strict ID requirements over the last decade, um, but um, there hasn't been much more, um, and it's still um, a, a minority of states, um, but I, I do think that actually clarifying those requirements are important. I think that people often hear about ID requirements in one state and are confused and think that that requirement applies in their state. And I think that that's a, I think in broad, another challenge for journalists in this space is that the rules do vary state by state, jurisdiction by jurisdiction. And if you're covering something in one place, um, you know, that, that voters in another place um, are, are gonna be confused and think that that applies to them as well. And so being mindful of that is important. Um, but I, I do think the um, the changes have been, you know, by and large, in a positive direction this year on um, on ID, at least as it relates to absentee ballots. Scott, what are you? How are you uh, covering this issue? Yeah, I think this is just uh, another area out of out of many that we talked about, where to to really cover what's going on in this election, um, you you need to know how to cover the courts. Uh, and, and what's going on in there. And it, you know, something that, that we've really had to keep in mind doing this is that you not only need to cover the cases and the decisions in them, but um, it's important to, uh, to have a sense of uh, when, when one of these decisions is final, uh, which, is, which is tricky uh, because there are so many different levels of courts that you can run through and, and a number of appeals. And, but, um, you know, it's, it's important to try and keep in mind in, in the coverage um, that people are looking for this information to figure out uh, what they ought to be doing. And if, if it could change, uh, it, it's, it's important to, to have some, um, some, some way of, of presenting that. And you know, we've been thinking about this in particular with uh, just dates of things changing um, in, in the coverage due to various uh, court cases, whether it's postmark deadlines for, for ballots or things like that, as opposed to the strictly voter ID. Or the, I, there was actually one day I remember, a um, very chaotic one uh, in, in the spring where um, the, the governor of, of Wisconsin essentially gave an order that was, as, as would have essentially postponed the Wisconsin primary. Um, in the morning that was overturned by the state Supreme Court in the evening, I think. And um, that's tough, right? You've got people 
uh, reading and and uh, planning to vote, trying to figure out what's going on. And um, I, I, I think it's just important to, to kind of place uh, these uh, changes in um, that 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 happen in the courts in the context of of you know where they could go from here in in appeals and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I like to segue to um, intimidation at the polls and threats to people's safety. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of rhetoric out in the social media atmosphere. I mean, how seriously should jurisdictions take these threats? And if you're a voter, what should you do? Wendy? Yeah, so, you know, it, it was shocking, um, or if one could be shocked, to hear the um, President of the United States during the debate issue a call to for vigilantes essentially to go to polling places in a way that was at least suggestive of a campaign to monitor and intimidate voters at the polls. Um, and, and I think that the fear that that drums up is um, a significant part of the damage. I think the um, specter of um, hordes of vigilantes is the, uh, it's in itself can intimidate and um, dissuade people from going to the polls. And the truth is that there are actually a whole lot of safeguards in place to prevent this from being a significant problem. And I, I kind of, and I feel like we should be emphasizing that people should be vigilant, but not scared. And, and there's a couple of safeguards I just sort of want to flag. It's our state and local election officials that are running elections. It is not the president of the United States. If somebody wants to be a poll watcher, there, there are very different rules in every state, but there is a process. You typically have to be certified. You often have to be, you know, certified. You have to be a representative of a particular either candidate or campaign or entity that has the, the right to do that kind of poll watching. There are strict rules that you have to follow and things you can and can't do. Um, election officials have also been prepared for this. This isn't the first election where there have been threats to send um, vigilantes to the polls, though it is the first election where um, the RNC, in 40 years, where the RNC can run a, what they call a ballot security operation without getting prior court, court approval, and I can explain that in a moment. But, but election officials all have processes in place to address any disruption at the polling place. They have rules about what it is poll workers need to do, how they notify election, um, both their own state, um, state and local election officials or other authorities who can end and any disruption. It is absolutely illegal in every state to intimidate voters um, <laughs> under our federal laws and also under state laws. It is illegal to discriminate against voters. It is illegal to purposely try to disenfranchise them. And so I, I just sort of think that that context is important. It is also important to know that federal forces and troops or armed officers may not be sent to any polling place or anywhere near a polling place. It is actually, would, it would violate criminal law to deploy any federal armed forces. So these are, this is bluster. This is, these threats are, are not actually accomplishable. That doesn't mean people won't try to disrupt damage they do it is absolutely damaging but it, it is not something that should dissuade people or generate fear people should understand it's a fear tactic and go vote <laughs> scott this is i think a, a, a true challenge for um, journalism organizations because um, there are thousands of polling places across the united states and um i mean how how, how do you wrap your your head around covering one or two or three polling places in your jurisdiction that um, where people are being um, intimidated or, or feel like their safety is being threatened. Yeah, and well, I think the, the first, you know, I, I think highlighting the, the norms around this uh, is, is important. Uh, like Wendy just mentioned that poll watching is not a, um, not a new or, or a bad thing. There are just norms around it that are, are 
uh, kind of going well well beneath the surface uh, in in the current conversation. Um, in in terms of disruptions uh, at, at polling places on election day, I think it's also important to, to keep in mind that um, you know there's going to be disinformation around this uh, on on election day, and, and have to to be uh, judicious and plan ahead of, about how to cover that because um, the the way um, the way we cover it as as journalists uh, could impact people's decision to to go vote or not and, and I, I just I think we have to keep that top of mind at, at all times can I just underscore that I think that that's a really important point and you know we talk with um, election officials nationwide and um, you know, both in providing them with support um, and um, also goading them into action as well. But um, one concern that I think many election officials have expressed is a fear that if there's a disruption in a polling place somewhere, it'll be splattered all over the news so that it looks like it is everywhere and that their voters will be have a mistaken impression that somehow there's, their polling places aren't safe or they'll have long lines when they don't. And I think that that's really important to keep in mind that, that how you cover this um, can have a real impact and avoiding that kind of over sensationalizing of a problem in one place in, or at least making sure that, it's, so that people understand that it is, this is a localized problem. This isn't a problem elsewhere. That's a really good point. Um, Dale, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, and I apologize for um, being late. Uh, it's an auspicious place for you to, to jump into the conversation because we're just about to talk about um, ongoing litigation in the states. And uh, maybe you can give us a, a brief overview of where things stand. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, early on in the pandemic, there was a wave of litigation um, challenging various rules and requirements that states maintain, which in ordinary times are maybe a nuisance or a burdensome, but take on a completely different character and significance um, during the pandemic, right? 16 states ordinarily do not permit um, every eligible voter to um, cast their ballot by mail if they so choose. Um, and so um, there was a, a round of litigation on that. Um, Right now, um, that number, I believe, is down to um, just five states um, that, are, that are not permitting um, every eligible voter to, to, to vote by mail. Um, we brought a number of lawsuits and five states whom we sued um, changed their rules to either let everyone vote by mail or to permit everyone to use COVID as a reason for voting by mail. Then you saw a wave of lawsuits about um, um, various restrictions and procedures for voting by mail. And some of these lawsuits are still ongoing. Um, we focused on at the ACLU requirements to have a witness um, watch you complete your ballot um, and then sign your ballot envelope um, in order for it to be counted. Um, that requirement, which about a, a dozen states have, um, was the number one reason for absentee ballot rejections during the Wisconsin primary, for example. Um, um, we've got litigation um, at the ACLU on, uh, on, on such requirements in six states. Um, we've gotten favorable rulings in five of those six. Um, two of them remain on appeal. Um, and um, um, oh, two of the five uh, that, that we, where we got favorable rulings and the one where we lost in Missouri is going up to the Missouri Supreme Court um, next week. Um, in addition to witness signature requirements, or well, actually one other point on witness signature requirements, how those are interpreted um, and applied is a, a big issue, um, um, uh, continues to be a big issue. So Wisconsin, where um, that requirement has remained in place, um, the Madison clerk's office, I just read about this morning, um, invited voters to bring their absentee ballots with them and have state employees serve as their witnesses. I think. Um, as many as about 10,000 ballots um, have been submitted um, um, in accordance with that practice. Um, but the Wisconsin Republican Party is threatening litigation over this, saying that that is not a valid uh, 
way to have someone witness a ballot for reasons that I, I, I don't quite understand, but maybe I'm missing something. Um, but then you have um, um, ongoing litigation over different kinds of requirements about who can convey an absentee ballot. Um, you know, that's in, in a, a case in Montana um, where um, um, assistance with the conveyance of ballots is, is, a, is a practice sometimes used on Native American reservations where people don't have access to mail. Um, the use of drop boxes is something that's being litigated in Pennsylvania, where the Republican Party is challenging the use of drop boxes, and in Ohio, where um, progressive organizations are challenging a limitation of one drop box per county in Ohio, right? So it doesn't matter if your county is 10,000 people or 600,000 people, just one drop box for all those people to um, shove their ballots into. Um, um, that's being challenged. So um, states are getting hit from both sides, those who are trying to restrict drop boxes, those who are trying to expand them. And then the one issue that I think may be the most significant in terms of just the sheer number of ballots affected um, is the deadline for um, absentee ballot receipt. Um, a number of states, including the three states that were pivotal in the 2016 presidential election, um, ordinarily use a received by election day deadline for their um, mail-in ballots. Um, um, some states, by contrast, use a postmarked by election day um, um, requirement, um, as long as it's received some certain number of days after three days in some states, like Friday after the election, or even Tuesday, um, one week. Um, those deadlines um, account for tens of thousands of ballots being rejected in um, states and um, you know, you don't need me to remind you how close um, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan were in 2016. Um, all of those deadlines in those three states have been modified um, pursuant to litigation. Um, Pennsylvania's um, state Supreme Court has ruled that ballots with a, an election day postmark um, can be counted. The Republican Party in Pennsylvania, the Trump campaign, are asking the United States Supreme Court to countermand that ruling. Um, in Wisconsin, a um, federal trial court recently ruled that a postmark by election day um, um, is adequate there. And the intermediate appellate, federal appellate court has declined to put that ruling on hold. So I'd imagine the Republican Party will be seeking the US Supreme Court to review that ruling as well. And in Michigan, a state trial court has ruled that a postmark the day before election day um, is adequate. Um, and uh, my understanding is the Republican Party is seeking um, an appeal of that in the Michigan state court system. So all of this is um, still um, unsettled. Um, those three states also have um, rules prohibiting the advanced processing of their absentee ballots. So I'm, I don't know if this is something that's been talked about already, but um, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin do not permit the processing of absentee ballots until polls close. Um, given the volume of ballots expected to be cast by mail this year, that means a substantial number, a percentage of the vote in those states will not even begin tabulating on election night. Um, so it may be the case that we don't know the winner of those states um, on election night, and um, that creates a, 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 an entirely different um, kind of political and public education and potentially even legal problem that I think we should probably talk about at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to give a shout out to Politico, which did, um, I think, just a, an extraordinary job in a story, I think that was published 10 days ago, um, outlining not just how voters can vote by mail, but when and how the votes are counted, uh, which is very important, as, as you just pointed out. And I will include a link to that political story in the, um, uh, in the online resources for this webinar. Um, so I, we're talking about mail-in voting. So Wendy, I know the Brennan Center has done some studies and research on, on this issue. Can you, um, can you bring us up to date on what those findings were? Um, so, I mean, I think we've been talking about a lot of different studies. I wanted to first underscore one of the things that Dale just mentioned about the, not, um, the possibility that we're not gonna know the results on election day. I'm sure many of you have heard this, but I think it bears repeating that this is also an area where the media, I think, has a special responsibility because it is the media that sets the expectations 
for when it is that results will be will come and to the extent that there is a potentially brewing plot to sow discord or challenge election outcomes or to uh, challenge Americans' faith in the legitimacy of the voting process, yeah, it, it might um, hinge on using that period of time while votes are still being counted to suggest that somehow that that is inappropriate. And I think it is really important for um, voters and Americans to understand in advance that that's in fact how the system works. That is the system that is appropriately how it's working, that the, the focus should be on counting every vote and that the vote count will in fact take longer this year because of the pandemic. And what we want is to make sure that our election officials are taking the appropriate time to get the count right. <laughs> They're gonna be doing it openly and transparently. This is that the count process is observed. There is nothing nefarious about this, but people should expect, and, and I think um, recognition, at least the polls are now showing that um, uh, now a majority of Americans think they probably won't get the results on election night, but I think that that's really um, an important point to underscore. Um, I, I think that the other, poll that I wanted to flag, and maybe sort of we started talking about studies, is that um, right now the vast majority of Americans, or let me all flip it, the, the poll suggests there's only a minor, a small minority of Americans, I think it was 22%, that actually are confident that we're going to have a free and fair election this year. And I think that that's a really um, significant problem. Um, that's driven in part. So, I, you know, we we absolutely have challenges and challenges that we need to fix and challenges um, of roles that need to be addressed um, through litigation. Um, but we've also seen a, a really unprecedented amount of changes to expand access to voting this year and to ensure and to remove barriers, especially to mail voting, which you know has newly become very um, necessary this year in, in, in much bigger ways than it has ever before. And I, I do think that um, while it's important to keep up the pressure and the demand uh, and on where the gaps still remain, you know, as you know, Dale mentioned, for example, like there are five states that don't let every um, eligible citizen vote by mail if they want to or if they fear um, that they could contract the coronavirus, that's absolutely unacceptable, but there are 45 states in DC that do, and that's been a dramatic shift. Now, um, you know, at the beginning of this year, it was 17, then 16 when Virginia passed its law. Like the numbers have been, you know, ticking downwards. And I think that actually bolstering, um, explaining where the strength is in the election system is also a really important thing to do, especially with all of the attacks on vote by mail. Um, as somehow being, you know, newfangled and uh, insecure, like those are not true. This is something that we know how to do as a country and, you know, there, there are improvements to be made, but that's something I was hoping to highlight. Yeah, uh, well, Scott, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit then. Um, you know, Wendy says that the media has a special responsibility. We know that journalists focus on the pre-election polls and then on election day, when the exit polls start to leak, there's just enormous pressure to, um, you know, to follow the bouncing ball. So what, I mean, what can media organizations, and you know, if you could address what Politico is doing, um, that'd be great. What can they do to um, really you know, damp down that, that speculation or anticipation that there will um, be a, a, a winner on election night or in the hours in the pre-dawn? on November 4th? Yeah, well, first of all, right now, we can just talk uh, and, and report about the process uh, and, and, um, and, and how it works. And, you know, it, it's, not, um, it, it's not boring. It's like, it's really interesting. And, and there's a lot of ways to, to get at it. And, you know, as, uh, as Dale mentioned, I mean, the, the three states that were the most important ones in, in deciding the last election are, are among those with the rules that, that make it least likely we'll know the results there. Uh, 
this year. That, that's a really that's a really interesting story. There, there are other important battleground states that uh, have a little bit more culture around voting by mail and how to deal with that, uh, where we might know results on on election night. Um, and and that's that's an interesting story. Uh, also, so that that's what we can do now, just in terms of setting expectations for not just uh, not just what the the what that might happen that we might not know the results, but why, uh, and and explaining that. And then I think looking forward to to election day, um, it's funny because this is the way uh, this is the way all the PSAs talk about voting too. But I I am a big believer in just having a plan. Uh, you know, we, we know, um, well, I, I shouldn't quite say that because the, something surprising always happens uh, in everything, <laughs> not just elections, but we, we know the general contours at this point, uh, of, of all the different scenarios that, that, that we can expect. And we can, we can sit down and plan now how to, how to deal with those so that we're not, um, so that we're not you know, slapping off a, a headline really quickly or, or the top of the story really quickly in the heat of a moment without thinking about what it means and, and how it's reacting. One of the things we're doing at Politico is we're trying to build in um, uh, a fair amount of the information that we just talked about in terms of the um, uh, de deadlines for when absentee ballots uh, need to be received or, or postmarked or and, and then how, how they're processed once they are received. We're trying to build a lot of that into our election night results so that when people are looking at the numbers uh, on, on the screen of the latest returns, they also have the context of um, how, how votes are counted in the state and, and, and an understanding of um, you know, how, how close we are to, uh, to past turnout, which is the number of registered voters in the state, to, to get a sense of how complete or not the, the vote count is. I, I think that putting that information up there with those those horse race numbers, the exit polls, all that other stuff uh, that we all love is, is really important. Great. Um, we're running a little bit over time, so I'd just like to ask Wendy and Dale um, if they could suggest resources that journalists can tap into to cover these issues, in addition to, of course, the work that your own organizations are doing. Dale? Sorry. Um, uh, resources on what, what particular, on what in particular, Sandy, if I may ask. Um, on issues that, about uh, uh, voting barriers and voter suppression issues. Organizations that you think are trusted uh, resources for journalists. Well, I hope um, um, we are, right? The ACLU and the Brennan Center, um, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, um, which operates a, a, a nationwide non- partisan election protection program um, and a hotline to respond to issues that voters encounter. Um, they're kind of a clearinghouse for problems that occur both once early in-person voting starts and on election day and a, and a, and a good reliable source for um, problems that folks are seeing on the ground. Um, if you're looking for information on like just the number of ballots cast, how many are outstanding, um, how many have been rejected, um, the U.S. Elections Project, run by Michael McDonald from the University of Florida, he's doing a fantastic job already of keeping track of the number of ballots cast um, by state, um, numbers rejected by state. Um, the numbers are pretty staggering um, already, you know, um, well over a million votes already cast this time in 2016, I think around 10,000. So voter, voter, voter interest is high. People want to flatten the curve, for, so to speak, for elections administrators. Um, if there are big problems with absentee ballot rejections, um, he's going to pick up on that faster than almost anyone because he's aggregating data from all 50 states. So his website, which is updated on an, at least a daily basis, um, has the best information on that kind of, um, 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 those kinds of events. Wendy, any additional organizations? No, I, I mean, I think that uh, certainly um, the organizations that Dale said are all excellent organizations. Um, I would 
underscore the um, election protection effort um, and 866hourvote.org is going to be an increasing source of um, information as it runs and, and, and we participate in it as well, a nonpartisan voter protection hotline that gets um, real time uh, stories of problems that are happening on the ground. Um, and I think that's a, another critical um, resource. And I, I do think there is, um, as you're thinking about the voter information provision, I think it's important to use official sites given the, the real um, prevalence of disinformation and misinformation right now, state and local election official sites, and they've actually upped their game this year, so there's a lot more information that's um, better available than usual. Um, that's where you can have accurate information about the voting process um, in, in those particular jurisdictions, and so I, I, I want to encourage those particular sites. So those are, and you know, and if on particular issues, uh, happy to offline give people recommendations about particular organizations and experts. I guess another entity I'll, I'll just flag is the National Task Force on Election Crises. It's a um, cross-partisan task force. I'm a member of this that's um, been housed um, at an organization called Protect Democracy. Um, this is less about vote suppression, but on um, other kind of potential constitutional crises or um, legal risks to the election that might arise. Um, and I, it's another resource that I, I think will become increasingly valuable during um, the uh, coming uh, or at the, as election day approaches and recedes. Great. Well, thank you again to Wendy Weiser, Vice President for the Democracy Program at the Brennan Center for Justice, Scott Bland, Editor of Politico Campaign Pro, and Dale Ho, Director of the Voting Rights Project at ACLU. Resources from this webinar will be published online for your use, free of charge, at nationalpress.org.